Do I really want to piss off the hardcore Christians? Eh, I'm gonna go for it. Society has a very interesting relationship with Christian theology. And if you don't believe in it or follow it in any capacity, it has become so ingrained in our country that you're more than likely aware of the most well-known stories, if only through cultural osmosis. David and Goliath, the Ten Commandments, Crucifixion of Jesus, you get the idea. How good or bad this is is certainly up for debate and not a topic we're going to get into here, so put down your pitchforks. As such, our popular culture has taken a liberal use of Christian theology, either by retelling the stories of the Bible with maybe a few new twists here and there, or using and repurposing religious iconography to tell a new story. Whether it's making Superman a Jesus allegory or the Winchesters fighting God himself, American culture seems to have a certain fascination with Christian theology, regardless of personal religious affiliation. But very few stories in pop culture have dared to alter one of the most well-known stories of the Bible in such a way to actively challenge the theology and force you to look at it from an entirely different perspective. This is often because it tends to draw <coughs> negative attention from the more dedicated members of the religion. I'm sure I'll see you in the comments. But if a creative team were to take that risk and succeed, they would not only expand our preconceived notions of these famous stories, but teach entirely new and difficult lessons that we wouldn't consider otherwise. Well, we have one such story today with a short indie book known simply as Judas, published by Boom Studios in 2018, written by Jeff Loveness, with art by Jakku Brabelka. If you're watching this, I'm sorry if I butchered your name. Our story stars our titular character Judas, one of the most infamous villains in the Bible responsible for portraying Jesus to the chief priests for 30 silver pieces, and ultimately leading to the crucifixion. Judas, unable to live with the guilt of his betrayal, returns to silver and hangs himself. This is where our story begins, as Judas reflects on his life and the choices he made, wondering if they were his decisions at all. Did you know it would be me? From the beginning? Did you know all of it? Was that why you chose me? Was that the only reason you chose me? I tried so hard to believe, to be good. But you knew from the beginning. I never had a chance. These are his last thoughts before his body limply darkens in the shadows of a setting sun. His spirit then falls into the abyss, the place where all sinners are destined to dwell. His head wreathed with a black halo, his neck adorned with silver pieces. Judas quickly realizes where he is, and tries to deny. He doesn't belong here. But then, a voice he's all too familiar with responds, Yes, this was always your end. This was always your story. This causes Judas to reflect, particularly about his mother, a kind woman who believed in God and taught him to help people because there's always someone who needs you. A woman who ultimately died alone. Her death forced him to lead a cynical existence, helping who he could, but ultimately just surviving. That is, until he meets him, who simply asks him to follow. And follow he does, all the way into hell, where there inhabits demons and monsters straight out of the book of Ezekiel. He managed to avoid these demons, but as they pass, Judas' bitterness against Jesus only grows, lamenting on his time with him how much he believed in him, until a voice told him otherwise, until a voice told him the truth. If you could heal the sick, why is the world so full of suffering? If you could feed the hungry, why does the world starve? If you could walk on water, why make a world where men drown? If you could conquer death, why did she die alone? I believed. I believed you were the son of God. I believed you could change the world, but you chose not to. You chose to be this. And it wasn't enough. I wanted you to be better. And then he remembers that day, the day Judas did what he was born to do. At the last supper, Jesus signaled to him that he knew his plans, but that's not how Judas saw it. Jesus always knew what was going to happen. Judas was just following the script. He did what he wanted him to do, but his torment did not end. And now he's here, in the dark abyss, facing down the other denizens of hell who recognize him as the betrayer. But he is saved by the most unlikely of saviors, 
the Dark Prince himself, Lucifer. Upon recognizing his voice as the one in his head, Judas lashes out. But Lucifer remains unfazed. Instead, he offers Judas something he claims God would never give. The truth. It's at this point that Lucifer begins to tell Judas about the story they're all trapped in. The only story. The story in which Judas was destined to be a villain. Lucifer then regales Judas with the history of God's villains. The Pharaoh who's defied Moses, whose heart was hardened by God. And now Pharaoh drowns forever in an ocean of blood and pride because God needed a villain. Goliath, a soldier on the wrong side, struck down by God's chosen, and now condemned to fight an endless battle because God needed a villain. Zezebel, a cruel ruler that God chose not to speak to despite saving others from their own cruelty. But as Lucifer puts it, she was ambitious. She didn't need God. And now she falls endlessly in the pits of hell, never to reach the bottom. And lastly, Lot's wife, never even given the dignity of a name in the book of God, whose only sin was looking upon God's genocide of Sodom and Gomorrah. And for that sin, she now remains frozen in stone, forever looking over a barren landscape. This all leads to Lucifer's ultimate truth. The story is broken. He then regales Judas with his role in the story, how he lived in paradise and saw it for the lie it was. So he told the truth and warred against God. When Judas asked why did he do it, he simply replies, I saw what he really was, and it wasn't enough. I wanted him to be more. And then when Lucifer fell, he too realized that when all is said and done, there is no escape from the story. Judas pushes back from his telling of events. He's the devil after all, why should he feel sorry for him? But Lucifer retorts, questioning if he is the one that should truly be considered the villain. Do I command you to kill in my name? To murder your sons? Do I demand constant praise? I only want you to be free, to know yourself, to know the truth, that he's broken, just like the rest of us. Lucifer then pushes Judas further, asking how it felt to have Jesus parade around, acting as if he knows the first thing about being human. Like he was spitting in my face, replies Judas. The conversation is interrupted as Jesus says his last words upon the cross before passing away. Lucifer watches with glee as he explains that if Judas truly wanted to be the Messiah and take all of their sins, then there would be no paradise waiting for him, only the crowded pits of hell. So Jesus falls, crashing into the eternal depths, confused as to where he is and why. But then he sees Judas, and he understands completely. Judas attempts to confront Jesus, asking if he knew what he would do the whole time. But he is quickly interrupted by a boastful Lucifer, mocking Jesus for not seeing this coming, how his story was broken from the start, how his father has abandoned him. He watches the full weight of all of man's sins swarm Jesus' body, providing a greater torture than a crown of thorns could ever hope to attain. Now you know what it's like, taunts Lucifer, what it's always been like for the rest of us, to suffer and pray so earnestly, so faithfully, to believe and to hear nothing. Lucifer gives Judas time to confront him properly now that Jesus lies weak. He lets his anger reign as he rails against the would-be savior. I followed you. I gave up my life for you. All those years together. Why didn't you warn me? Why didn't you save me? It was the only way, replies Jesus. And as Jesus looks upon the billions and billions of people he failed to save, suffering for eternity under the weight of their sins, Jesus admits that he knew what Judas would do from the very beginning. And with that confession, Judas condemns Jesus as the true betrayer and lets the legions of hell overwhelm and drag him to the depths. Judas has had his revenge. But then he notices something. His eyes while tired, while beaten, while broken, carry no hate to the man who has now condemned him. They never did. He makes no attempt to fight off the mountains of people actively dragging him down, nor does he hate any of them. He chose love instead. 
And then Judas realizes that for all Jesus has done and for all the pain he caused him, he doesn't hate him for it. He's trapped in the story, same as him. Judas realizes his mistake as he watched the ground beneath Jesus crumble and plummet. But he now knows, as broken as the story is, Jesus is still the only hope they have. So he leaps in after him, the place where even the devil dares not go. But push forward he must, avoiding the grasp of the demons as described in the book of Revelation. While the demons try to stop him, they do not follow, for they know what lies beyond the door. A son of God, crucified upon the blunt-tinged thorn veins of all of man's sins. The death of hope. Judas pulls him down as Jesus weakly describes the horror that awaits the people he tried so desperately to save. There will be so much pain and death because of me. Endless suffering because of my name. I wasn't enough. They cannot be saved. Lucifer was right. He was always right. The story is broken. Judas says nothing as they both give themselves to the darkness and despair that comes with the death of hope. But in the silence, Judas receives a vision from God, recanting the story of Abraham, commanded to sacrifice his own son. But then God himself stopped him. It was a test, not for Abraham, but for himself. God wanted to know if it could be done, to sacrifice his son for the greater good, to endure the pains of hell alone. And that's when Judas realizes why he's there. God didn't want him to be alone. He remembers the teachings of his mother and goes to the weak and defeated savior. Judas doesn't know the right words to say, so he uses his. Come, follow me. And so he picks Jesus off the ground, finding new purpose and a new meaning to his story, as it was always meant to be. Judas asks Jesus if he can truly come back from the dead, if he can truly escape this evil place. But Jesus replies that only he who is without sin can defeat death. Not their sins, but his. Judas Iscariot, can you forgive me? Asked Jesus. Lucifer interrupts them, telling Judas to join him and they can be free of the story once and for all. But Judas denies him. He agrees that the story is broken and always has been. But he doesn't believe in the story. He believes in his savior. Lucifer does not take this kindly and forcibly tries to take Jesus away. But then a miracle happens. I forgive you, replies Judas. This triggers the ascension of Jesus Christ as he rises above hell itself, but not before delivering one final message to his disciple. I will tell her, and she will say, this is my beloved son, in whom I am well pleased. And with that, Jesus ascends back into the world to truly save it, while Judas remains in the dark abyss. But he chose love, and he can keep choosing it. He fulfilled his role in the story, but he can take comfort in Jesus' final words and take his lessons to even the darkest corners. And as he helps a poor lost soul stand apart from his grief, he explains that the story is broken, but so are we. We may not have a say in how our story will unfold, but we can have faith that there is more to our story than we can see. And while we can't always choose what happens to us, we can choose love. Love is always an option. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. It's strange to imagine a story where one of Bible's most well-known and infamous villains is portrayed as the victim, and done so with such deep care and interest in Christian theology. Because while basing the story around Judas in a way that portrays God and Jesus as the real sinners might seem blasphemous to some, the story and central message it imbues through it is very emblematic of the lesson Jesus would teach. How do you forgive the one person you trusted with the ultimate betrayal? After all, Judas isn't wrong for feeling the way that he does. He has every right to feel betrayed. 
the person he admired, the person he followed and idolized, knew what he would do and what would happen to him the whole time, but did absolutely nothing. He let Judas go against his own values. He let Judas be corrupted by anger and resentment. He let Judas go to hell when he could have done so many things to stop it. But he didn't. And because of his deliberate inaction, Judas is just another victim in the story. But despite all of that, despite all the anger and bitterness that Judas has every right to feel, he still finds a way to embody the virtues that Jesus taught him and forgives him. How? How do you do that? How do you just let that go? How do you decide that betrayal no longer matters? The answer, as it seems, is to decide that that betrayal doesn't define you. It doesn't make you. It doesn't have to guide your choices or your heart any more than you let it. Because no matter if your life is in your hands or out of your control, you can still choose how you'll approach it. Will you approach with resentment and anger, raging in a world that treated you unfairly and left you for dead? Or will you choose love and offer kindness to the souls that need it the most? Judas chooses the latter by book's end, but it's by no means an easy decision to come to, and the journey to do so is a painful one. This is especially true for Judas, who has been led astray not just by Jesus in action, but also by the voice of Lucifer, who is the first to plant doubts into Judas' mind, who begins to convince him that Jesus is not all he appears to be, that he could be so much more and chooses to be less, who shows Judas the truth and lets him dwell in it. The interesting thing is, for all intents and purposes, Lucifer is completely right in almost everything he says. The story is broken. The story creates villains from the same kind of people God would save, and you can't escape it. But the way in which Lucifer portrays the story is warped by his own feelings towards God. Just like Judas, Lucifer wanted God to be more than he was willing to give, and he too discovered his role in the story was preordained from the beginning. He too feels betrayed by the one person he trusted more than anyone else. But the main difference between him and Judas is that Judas finds a way to choose love, while Lucifer will forever revel in his own hatred, in his need for revenge, and it's represented in every action he takes. When he tells Judas his story, his words ooze venom at every syllable. He watches Judas being tormented in hell with obvious glee, reveling in his chance for revenge. He sees in Judas a kindred spirit because he, unlike so many others who enter his domain, understand what it's like to be betrayed by a member of the Almighty. But he turns on Judas the minute he reveals that he's moved past his pain. Lucifer, in this story, represents the beginning of the journey of forgiveness because it is angry, desperate, lonely, and heartbreaking. Where you're so distraught by the realization you made that the only way you can sanely respond is in anger and hate. And he also represents where you'll remain if you don't find a way to love. Alone, forever angry, and forever a prisoner of that anger in your own personal hell. And Judas almost falls into that trap. He almost follows Lucifer's example and watches Jesus be tortured by the means of hell. But then something happens. He sees no hate in Jesus' eyes. And it's at that point that Judas realizes that while what Lucifer said is true, and the story is broken, and it is true that Jesus betrayed him. Judas was still wrong about one very important thing. Jesus couldn't have been more. He already was. He was a man who would always choose love over hate. And in realizing that, Judas begins the path to making that same choice. And that choice comes when God grants him a vision of the story of Isaac. How is a story not meant to test Abraham's loyalty, but meant for God to test himself. In seeing this vision, Judas makes a second and most profound realization. For all of the power both God and Jesus claim to have, for all of the omnipotence they say they hold and the wisdom that comes with it, they are both still fallible. They both have uncertainty and they both don't want the ones they care about to suffer. That God truly created us in his own image because we are all just as scared and just as capable of making mistakes. That's how Judas can truly replicate the teachings of Jesus, because he realizes that the teachings don't come from a God who knows and sees all, but
but they come from a human being, trying to do the right thing despite being afraid and full of doubt, who will empathize with those around him and truly guide them to a better future. That's something any of us can at least try to emulate, and Judas does. He realizes that Jesus' teachings aren't that different than the one given by his mother, and chooses to love the man who hurt him because he recognizes that that man is still good. But even if he wasn't, neither Jesus or his mother would want him to leave any lost soul in darkness. So while none of the facts of the story changed, as well as his role in it, Judas chooses what kind of person he would be in his narrative. He would choose to be the man who would always help someone who needed it. He would choose not to leave the lost souls alone in their grief. He would choose to forgive a man of his betrayal because he recognizes his humanity. And this is where I have to acknowledge my own fallibility because this is something I am very much not good at. There are a lot of people who are in my life and who still are who have done things and said things that I have not forgiven them for. I'm not sure how or if I even want to. And that anger and bitterness sleeps heavy on my heart all the time. I don't know when I'll be ready to let that go or if I ever will be, but I'm trying. Because I need to. Not because it's unhealthy to hold on to, because it is, or because that anger is an addiction that I need to break, which it also is. But because it's right. Because it's good. Because we need to create the love we want to see in the world, even if others will not return the courtesy. And it is hard. Especially when you need to forgive someone you trusted, someone you looked up to, whether it's a parent or a best friend, because there are so many emotions that build into that hate that are difficult to reconcile with. It's never just anger. It's sadness, heartbreak, it's disappointment, it's pain, and it feels so good to hold on to all of that, to throw that back at them with every ounce of rage you can muster. Because then you can make yourself into the victim of your narrative. You can make yourself this martyr who sees a slimy snake for who they really are. And they are the ones that hurt you. And many will never apologize or even feel guilty of what they did. So why should they be forgiven? Why should they get a pass? Why shouldn't they get any kind of consequences for the things they did? Why do they deserve my forgiveness? And the truth is they might not. They may not deserve it. They may never feel remorse, and they may never get any kind of consequences for their actions, despite how much they should. But sometimes forgiveness isn't even about them. It's about clearing space in your heart to make room for love, compassion, empathy, everything we can use to help someone who needs it. Because hate and anger take up so much room. And it can dominate so much of the narrative you tell yourself that it can consume everything else that makes your life and the lives of others better. That's not to say you can't be angry at someone or that you even need to associate yourself with them ever again because anger is still something you're supposed to feel sometimes. And there's even ways you can make it useful, but it's not meant to stay. That hate, that bitterness, that cold abyss is not meant to stay. But love is, and we need to fight to keep it there. I'm still trying really hard to see that and to see the people who hurt me as human and fallible. To understand what they did and why without turning them into the villains of my story. If I'm being honest, I'm not succeeding. But as long as I keep trying to make space, I believe I'll get there someday. And I hope the rest of you would join me in that journey. Whether you believe in the Bible and Jesus or not, there are still many lessons that he can teach. Even when you twist the mythology, you can still find new lessons to pass on. And as you all walk through your personal hells to find a better way, I hope you find a way to create love out of that pain. And I hope we'll see you there soon. <laughs>